Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Grover, and I want to welcome you to Ring the Alarm with Renee Cox and Sanford Biggers. I first want to thank Phyllis Hollis of Cerebral Woman, an online marketing platform designed to promote emerging and mid-career artists of color and female artists. You can learn more at CerebralWoman.com. So this conversation is the second in a series leading up to a 2023 exhibition that will be curated by Renee Cox for Guild Hall. And these talks are very conversational between creative colleagues, um, often friends of many years, and they're kind of off the cuff, a little bit like listening in to, to artists in their studio or in their home. So the first talk, which was in August of this year, was between Renee Cox and Derek Adams, and that is online and you can view it on the Guild Hall YouTube station. Um, the format of the tar talk is this. We're gonna start with slides uh, and a video by both artists. The artists, um, their videos will be shut off, but you'll be able to hear them talking about the works. And then we will bring them on screen at the end of the slideshow. And the conversation will be around 40 minutes, uh, followed by a 10 to 15 minute long Q&A. So about an hour, a little over an hour altogether. Please remember to post your questions in the chat box and I will return at the end of the conversation and aggregate those and ask them of Sanford and Renee. But first I'm going to introduce our two panelists before we start the slideshow. So Renee Cox was born in Colgate, Jamaica in 1960. She makes photographs, collages and installations that draw on art history, fashion, photography and popular culture. Her work invokes a critical vision of female sexuality, beauty, power, and heroism through nudity, religious imagery, and symbolism that inform her interdisciplinary process. Renee Cox received her BA from Syracuse University and her MFA from the School of the Art Institute, uh, I'm sorry, the School of Visual Arts. She was a participant in the Whitney Museum of American Art Independent Study Program. Her work has been included in solo and group exhibitions at prominent institutions, including the Tate Liverpool, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the New Museum of Contemporary Art, Brooklyn Museum, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, to name a few. She is an associate professor at Columbia University and has lectured at Yale College of Art, New York University, and Parsons School of Design, to name a few. She lives and works in Manhattan and Amagansett. Sanford Biggers was born in 1970 and raised in Los Angeles. He currently lives and works in New York City. His work is an interplay of narrative, perspective, and history that speaks to the current social, political, and economic happenings while also examining the context that bore them. He's explored subjects such as the Underground Railroad, police brutality against Black Americans, and the appropriation of African iconography. As creative director and keyboardist, he fronts Moon Medicine, a multimedia concept band that straddles visual art and music with performance. Sanford Biggers, Biggers was awarded the 2017 Rome Prize in Visual Arts. He has had solo exhibitions at the CAM St. Louis, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, Mass Mocha, Brooklyn Museum, the Bronx Museum of Art, among others. Biggers work is held in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan, the Whitney, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Walker Art Center, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, among others. So we're going to begin with a slideshow that the artists have uh, prepared. And you'll watch the slides, you'll hear their voices, and then the slideshow will end with a video. And then Renee and Sanford will join us on screen for a conversation. So don't forget to post your questions in the chat box and I'll return at the end. Thanks so much. That Albert. Fatal Bert. Mm. 
That was very powerful when I saw that in Miami. I don't know yeah. why people thought you were trying to shock everybody or something like that. Yeah. I mean, what's more shocking is what's happening in our communities of us being shot every week. Yeah, I <laughs> agree. <twice> <laughs> I agree. I, I was doing a lecture once and I, I sort of, you know, made a quip saying that, you know, I understand how some of the work can be offensive, but if you think of the conditions that bore the work, you should probably be more offended at that. No, exactly. D. That piece right there is called The Talk. This is the bet one based on the Panthers with Bobby Seale and, uh, Tangie's father, George. Moore. No, no, not this one. Not this one. You'll see that one. But this one, okay. that's just the talk, you know, like the talk that you have to give your black male kids <laughs> or but, your black kids in general about how to but, uh, navigate. Yeah, that's public the life. Comes from soul culture. Mm -hmm. That's me dealing with uh, fractals and sacred mm -hmm. geometry. I like that picture. I haven't seen that. That's a new one from the pandemic. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So Look at that. Yeah. This is the one. That's the one. Yeah. Right. With Tan Tangy Pops, right? And that, yeah, wow, exactly. I didn't know that. George Murray. I didn't know that until we were, co uh, I was rolling up to the exhibition to the opening, and I didn't know that. And Tangy literally called me while I was still in the car on the way there and told me. I was like, what? I had no clue. That's amazing. Yeah. Is he still teaching? He was at where? San Francisco State. Yeah. I don't think he is now. But right. um, yeah, yeah. But I did hear him on a podcast lately that I think uh, came out last year. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about these? Because I haven't seen these and um, I don't believe they've been shown in New York. They have. I haven't been shown in New York. This is the most recent series of work. I call them Chimera. Uh -huh. um, so they're sort of like shape sh shapeshifters. Well, we can get into it because I'm looking at yours and there's a lot of similarities to aspects of beauty and sort of transgressive representation of form, female and male form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, this is like one of my first self portraits that I did back at uh, Syracuse when I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. Running back and forth every, you know, 10 seconds. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, wow. That's Yeah, beautiful. so all these from the Chimera series are sort of riffing off of classical and neoclassical sculptures, Greco-Roman sculptures, and various sculptures and objects from different African countries. Mm -hmm. and cultures. Who are those masks from? Um, which one? This one that we're looking at right now. Oh my God. I am not gonna remember off the top of my head, but I it's will okay. say that <laughs> many, of these, many of these are actually fusions because I didn't want to get it too stuck in one particular area. Okay. And it's also questioning some ideas of provenance and origin. So mm -hmm. I purposely start to mix um, some of the faces. Got you. Got you. Because it was like part of it was reminding me of, I think, what is it, the sand day? Mm -hmm. Had a little bit of that vibe. This is because I need to change the damn constitution, get rid of Trump, and like we need that people of color rewrite this thing. So. <laughs> I remember when you did this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I heard you say something about the quilt that they were used by um, the Underground Railroad. So there's rumors, there's been rumors going around academia for years that uh -huh. quilts were used on the Underground Railroad. And there's, you know, a bunch of historians who believe maybe they were and a bunch that said that they were not. But the vernacular, you know, history has still transcended and still exists that different types of quilt patterns or where they were hung or located on the outside of a home um, could symbolize uh, that the safe house was open and escaping enslaved people could stay there that night or if it was hung or folded a certain way meant to keep going that were under surveillance 
and sometimes even coordinates and, and map instructions loosely coded into the quilts. So that mm. sort of started that body of work was thinking of the idea of coding. What does it mean to then add other layers of code from a different time period from a different person? So that it you know, carries on the patchwork tradition, you know, being made by a group of people, but at the same time it adds a temporal element to it. Right. And you got the lotus there as well. Mm -hmm. now, I love this. When, when did you take these, this, this particular series right here? This is in Jamaica, this right? This is uh, Queen Nanny of the Maroons. And I shot, well, it was shown in 05. It took like two years to do. Um, going back to um, Portland in Jamaica, where Queen Nanny lived and where they still have a maroon community that's like its own little sovereign state run by a colonel. Don't ask me why it's a colonel, but that's what it is. And they don't pay taxes in Jamaica and whatnot. And they, you know, rule themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's real powerful, like that place. There's a lot of energy there. It's kind of like going to like Machu Picchu or the Sacred Valley or something. Mm -hmm. It's super like positive, energized. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. These are amazing, these busts. So you'll see a few of them. I have an upcoming show at Mary Boski Gallery called Soft Truths. And there'll probably be, there's four or five of them that will be in that show, all new. The show is wow. supposed to open in April. So, you know, now it's finally after the postponement happening. Right. And I remember first seeing we'll get to see that in person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, the other one was Your Mama's Last Supper. Right. I was like, wait, they didn't even mention that. I read your New Yorker article. <laughs> and it went to like, what was it, Chris O'Feely. And then they go all the way back to Serrano. And I was like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> mm -hmm. In terms right. of controversy. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I was like, wait, they leave the women out. You know, it was like me, it was Karen Finley. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we're yeah. stuff too. And I yeah. was like, we went yeah. all the way back to Andre. I mean, you know, love him, but I was right. like, hi, I'm there too. <laughs> well, we got a chance to rewrite that now. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ring the alarm. By the way, by the way, why'd you pick that uh, tenor saw, right? Why'd you pick that uh, as a As, as a, a title? title? Yeah. This is to let people know. It's yeah. a new day, honey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those people who don't know what we're talking about, the, the name Ring the Alarm is a classic uh, dance hall, uh, just a dance hall classic, basically. Right. Yeah. And we know dance hall classics, they last forever. Oh my God, version, version. Yeah. <laughs> Look at you. That's what I, we were sharing. Well, not sharing, but we were in the same sort of studio space area of uh -huh. 49. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going through my stuff and I was like, wait a second, I've got a portrait. I've got portraits of him that I did. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta share these with me. Cause that, that looks like the uh, the extent of facial hair that I've most that I've ever had, ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not gonna lie, I did go in there and do a little something, something. Okay, you know? I didn't know if you're gonna bring that. I didn't know if you're gonna do that or not. You made a connect. <laughs> I, you know, it's like I, I always, you know, I always got to put my little hands in there. But you did a good job because I always wondered what I would look like with it. So that would look good. Like, look how good that looks. <laughs> hey, man, you know, I'm looking, I got to, you know, start pumping my vitamin E or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, no, really. You know, I always say once a fashion photographer, kind of always a fashion photographer. So, mm -hmm. you know, you want to make people look good. <laughs> well, and I like, I remember that night. We had a lot of fun and that was so fun that you put me in stuff that I'd been living with in my studio for years and, you know, never put on myself. It's so weird how, you know, it takes me a while before I wear and put on the things that I have around me all the time. Right. And I remember you telling me like, these were all these Japanese kimonos that you had collected. <laughs> And that you have people that send you kimonos and whatnot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you had like a, a lot of them. Yeah. Ah. Well, they, they end up in the uh, in the quilt work. So I use a lot right. of uh, kimono fabric. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I've worn my hair like that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a Benin bust on top of, I think, yeah, an Aphrodite mm. sculpture. 
So yeah, when I was looking, I was like, you were really a mixologist. Yeah, well, patchwork. Yeah. You know, uh, I do, I think of everything in terms of patchwork, even if it's a patchwork of ideas or genres or materials. Right. Um, so patchwork to me is not limited to just textile. Oh, you know? no, not at all, not at all. No, I mean, you totally embrace the, you know, interdisciplinary, you know, it's like whatever it takes to get your message across. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you do the same. I remember, and we'll see some more pictures as they come up, but, um, I really had a great time coming to your studio when we were on 149 and you started the new works, the new collage series. Oh yeah, the fragment of soul culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, adapting the approach to, to uh, serve the concept. Mm-hmm, uh, exactly. And then for those of you who don't know, this is the show that's currently up at the Bronx Museum. Yeah, the show is called Code Switch. And it's at the Bronx Museum, and it'll be up until January or February. Um, and it's over around, around 60, 65 different uh, quilt-based works, two-dimensional and three-dimensional, with a couple of video pieces in as well that relate to uh, the quilts and pattern work. And also for the uninformed, you had a, a lot of inspiration coming from the, what did they call the G? The oh, G bend. The, G Bend women. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it was after seeing the show of G Bend uh, quilts at the Whitney Museum. I think it was 2002 oh, yeah. wish or so. You remember that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you know, I sort of thought, oh, this is some of the best painting I've seen in here for in quite a while. Right. <laughs> um, made me start to think, ah, oh, well, maybe it's time to break out the paint skin because I I stopped painting. You know, I went to grad school for painting and didn't paint at all during grad school. So right. You know, this was a return to, I guess, two-dimensional. Although, you know, it's three-dimensional, it's soft sculpture, it's it's all the above, but. Right, because you've got the origami things going on as well. Mm -hmm. that are working that, this is the dance floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that dance floor was done in around 2000, 2001. Um, and it was part of a big breakdance competition called the Battle of the Burrows. Uh, mm. And it actually was at the Bronx Community College, and that was the official dance floor. And David Ellis and I put it together, and we put a video camera above it, so it documented all the dancers doing their circular moves on top of this circular mandala. And then it was later shown at PS1, and we invited all the dancers down to PS1 to, to the clock tower. And it was up to them whether they wanted to or not, but at any point, they could just start breakdancing on it. Um, right. I didn't want to mandate that they danced on it because I didn't want them to be quote unquote entertainment. But right, exactly. if, it inspired, if, if they were inspired to do it, they could. But of course, right. the scuff marks are all over the piece. So you could tell when the, when the actual floor was there, you could tell that people had danced on it. And as it travels throughout the world, people are allowed to dance on it in whatever venue it is. And what you're looking at right there is the video documentation of it being projected down on the floor. Okay. Right, and I was like giving you that sort of Busby Berkeley kind of vibe. Yeah, exactly. Like, and shapes and whatnot. Yeah, Busby Berkeley was definitely. I love that you know, Busby Berkeley stuff. I mean, I was looking at that when I was doing Soul Culture as well. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. the the orchestration and choreography to do those things. Could you imagine? Mm -mm. No. You know? <laughs> And the mirror effects and the kaleidoscopes, yeah. And oh, sometimes, yeah. you know, it was a very small group of dancers, but through, you know, various uh, special effects and mirrors, they were able to make it look like hundreds of dancers. Right. No, that's amazing. Ah, uh, this is the killer one. Damn. This one is Bam. Yeah, I think that's what sort of started uh, me going back and looking at classical sculpture. Right. I think we can go to our video now. Yeah, no, Bam was like intense. Um, that was, I remember seeing it in, in Florida and it was like, whoa, because it was just so pertinent. Mm -hmm. of uh, 
these unfortunate times that we live in where certain people believe that we're just, you know, freaking target practice or whatever. So. Yeah, well, you know, to your comment earlier that, you know, some people were offended by, you know, some people are always going to be offended by work. So, you know, that's going to happen. But, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but, it's, but I think it's actually important to note that that piece was literally in the same room as the BAM sculpture, sculpture that you just saw being shot. Right next to a bronze that was cast of the remnants of that sculpture. So the entire installation was really about this small power object right. and this inflated large power object. One right. day out of bronze and the other, you know, inflatable. So soft power versus hard power. There was a lot of other elements to that as an installation that got overlooked because, you know, clickbait. Right. But, it but was, you're not, you know, I mean, you're no stranger to controversy. I mean, gee, you have courted with controversy with most of your works. <laughs> yeah, I'm known for that, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, even back from when you were at the Whitney program, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yep, 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 yep. I have been, you know, I mean, I think you said it, I say it as well. I mean, I didn't set out to do that. That wasn't right. my uh, plan. It's just, that's the way it's perceived. I think when black folks speak the truth about what's happening in their lives and environments, uh, some other people find it uh, somewhat offensive. Mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. then I just have to say, well, that's their issue. That's not my issue. I'm working through the things just like you are because you're, you're invested in history and so am I. And, we all know history is written by the victors, so. It is, but you know, I like to think that history is also open source. And I say that because you see how it gets manipulated and molded to serve the nature of whoever, whoever's retelling the story. I mean, you can look at the education system, you can look at the current <laughs> government right now. Exactly. It's all revisionist. So, you know, part of that is for us to rewrite these histories. Exactly, which that's something I believed in from the very beginning, and that's something that attracted me to your work as well. Mm -hmm. that right, rewriting those histories, you know. And I would say, I mean, yours, you know, they're, they're even more, they're, su they're subtler than mine, you know what I'm saying, in a lot of ways, because I think you have that, the spirituality in mind comes out now, but you've always had that sort of spiritual thing going on with it, that other consciousness. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, you know, it's, well, you know, it's also in that respect, my work is autobiographical, you know, I try not to have my image, my personal <laughs> persona right. facade in the work too much, but right. I think there is an autobiographical essence in the work, but right. I also but try to, to be. yeah, yeah, it's like, I, yeah. I would say that about everybody's work to some exactly. degree, definitely, if they can connect to it that way. But um, it's, I never really do anything to make a quick read. It's always complex. When you think you've got one piece of the information, if you look again, you'll get more information. Right. So, which makes it difficult to make work in a time like this when, you know, especially now since everyone's viewing on screens, to, you know, there's so many cursory views. It's like, if it doesn't bling out right in, you know, the first image, some people don't even see it. So sure. it's sort of difficult at a time when you're doing three dimensional objects and you need people to really breathe the air of that 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 particular insulation or work of art right well i mean i feel that with you know my soul culture stuff where it's all hand cut and whatnot and it is three-dimensional and now it's thrown back into a two-dimensional plane <laughs> and i'm like oh man you know like the show that we're in at the columbia the triennial yep. you know i was like okay great now finally people will be able to see this in person and no you can see it in 3d form and I'm like, okay, that's cool, but there's not that tactile. You can't go to the side and look at it. You yeah. don't see the shadows. You don't see the depth of it. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, hopefully they'll allow people in eventually so that they can I think that's it. their plan, you know, and I yeah. remain optimistic because if you think about it like this, those people who really want to see the work will go. Right. And when they do go, they're actually rewarded because they don't have to compete with you know 100 other people in front of them. They can actually spend a lot of time and, and marinate and meditate. 
Exactly. And that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. People need to get out of their head. And that, to me, that's what that work was all about anyway. You know, just in mm -hmm. the same way that your um, Lotus is. Mm -hmm. the uh, Using the uh, slave ship, mm -hmm. you know, format. Mm -hmm. Of like where people can look at it and it's just like very tranquil, Buddhist, uh, sort of spiritual kind of thing. You know, it's like all about like breathing. And then when you get close, you see like, holy shit, this is like the slave ship of like packing in 357 people in some cramped area where they're living with their feces and urine and everything. And it was just one big horror show. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a seduction to deal with like, you know, tri triumph through tribulation. The Lotus would be the triumphant uh, transcendent moment, but the tribulation that got us there is the, is part of this, the real issue. And you know, that piece is clear so that when people walk around it, they see each other through the glass. It sort right. of implies everybody in the commerce or this aspect of trade, whether directly or indirectly, it affects us all, you mm -hmm. know? But I want to ask you, because you've sort of worked with really direct and very political in your face work, and then you're working right now with bold imagery, but a lot of subtleties and nuances, especially because I've seen those works in person and there's so much happening. Right. Um, how has that been for you? Are you? How do you see this work in relationship to the old work? What's the connective tissue, and where do you think they uh, separate? I think I don't think they necessarily separate. I see it as an evolution, my own evolution, yeah, of uh, my own growth, my maturity, my um, having another understanding of uh, sort of like a higher level of consciousness is what I really see. I mean, my work changed to soul culture. And I've said this many times, but I'll say it again. Like when I understood how to get out of my head and how to be happy and how to deal with the negative thoughts that go through everybody's mind on a perpetual basis, which is generated, but usually by the ego. And once I understood how to break that, or how to deal with it or you know, negotiate it because it never goes away, but you can be the sort of witness to those thoughts. And once you do that, at least for me, everything changed. Like it, and it, it's, it's, it's cliche, it happened for me in Bali and whatnot. You know, I was feeling sorry for the little me. I was in this beautiful hotel with a butler and everything. And I'm like, and I was traveling alone and I was like, why don't I have a retrospective? Why don't I have a book? Why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? And, you know, I was like a complete nut job. And <laughs> somebody said to me, you know, listen to Eckhart Tolle. And I couldn't listen to him before because he talked too slow. But at this point I was ready to shoot myself. So I listened to him and he calmed me down. He made me feel like, whoa. And then he said one thing that changed my entire perspective. He goes, why are you asking the world to validate you? And I was just like, oh my God. Like, you know, I'd lived my entire life. You know, at that point, five decades of asking the world to validate me. And he goes, who are you asking? You're asking crazy people. Pick up a newspaper, look at a history book. <laughs> Why are you asking these people? Why are you giving these people so much power over your well-being? And I changed entirely. And long story short, I came home. My husband thought I had joined a cult because I couldn't like listen to him complain because he's French and that's what the French do. It's like national pastime. And I was just like, I can't listen to you complaining. You have to go to the person that can make the change. And I'm not the one that can change Metro North and take away the ugly people that ride Metro North. <laughs> So for me, that's, that's what I went through, my shift. And it's been just so beneficial ever since. I mean, going through the pandemic, for me, a lot of people are like, oh my God, I'm so sad and depressed. And I'm like, no. And even my students, they were like, oh, I'm so bored. And I said, well, because you're bored with yourself. You know? <laughs> I said, you need to find some self-love. And I said, this gives me a great opportunity not to talk about me, but to say to you, you need to do self-portraiture. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's all you got right now. 
<laughs> mm -hmm. so. Well, I remember coming to your studio and, you know, Renee and I have had studios together for, I mean, close to 10 years. We were in one location on the far east side of Harlem. And then when that place closed down, yeah. And then after that, we moved to the east side and I mean, to the west side. And I remember coming in when this work was starting to get made and I had a long, I mean, I stayed there, we stayed there for hours talking. And there was such a difference in you between those two studios and the work. So this is when that transition was happening. Yeah. And there was a glow, you know, it was a glow yeah. in the work, there was a glow in you and it was very powerful. And I remembered you seemed so chill. And I don't know if I knew all the stuff that led up to that, but I definitely saw the results just uh, hanging with you that I time. Yeah. No, I mean, I totally, you know, I totally changed. You know, mm -hmm. there's this, Eckhart says, you know, once you've suffered enough, <laughs> you begin to understand. Now, some people, a lot of people enjoy their suffering. Their suffering mm -hmm. is part of their identity. Yeah, it's know? part of the reality. Yeah. Yeah. So, but once you let that go, it just changes entirely. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's like, I don't judge. I don't compare myself to people. You know, I just do what I need to do for me. And it's been a big, big help in my life situation. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and I want to ask you, because everybody always asks the female artists, how has it been that you are now a daddy? Mm -hmm. How has that affected you and your way of uh, thinking about the work and, you know, your practice and stuff? Has you know, it, it have, do you feel like it's had some sort of impact yet or, or are you waiting for it to grow up a little bit? <laughs> no, it's had an impact. I mean, I get the sense, I mean, you know, I'm three years, she's three years old now. So I get the right. sense that, you know, this is an ongoing thing of how it affects me and the work and me through the work and the work through me and every other variety of that equation. Mm -hmm. um, part of it, you know, I make a lot of art with her or, ah. you know, she allows me to make, <laughs> she allows me to be there when she makes art. Okay. And the confidence and the fun and the joy and the lightness of it is inspiring. And every time she gets up from doing something, I'm just kicking myself because I'm stuck in my head thinking, damn, why do I take so long? Why do I get so stuck? Why am I weighing all these things and considering all these things when I've been doing this so long that it's literally in my fingers and in my in my bones. Right. But my head is still in there. You know, like even you're saying about that freed mind, that that's the roller coaster, you know? You have it and then you mm -hmm. lose it and you have to get it back. You have to keep re-upping on that that transcendent moment. And watching her is helpful to do that. Um, makes me manage my time better for sure. Uh -huh. um, it's teaching me to relinquish a lot of things that I thought I had control over. Um, nice. I already had a lot of admiration for, I don't want to say professional women because that sounds like something from the eighties, but women who are <laughs> mothers and, you know, have their careers and doing myriad things um, uh -huh. and making it look easy. Mm -hmm. um, but now just having even more of a sense of that and just a sense of awe and humility from that. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's on and on and on. I mean, I, I can't wait for the next time because now I'm getting more receptive to the lessons that I learned from my daughter in her little studio. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. cool. So she's got her own little spot. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Well, you know, we've been transient because, uh, you know, like many people have during the pandemic, but right. every place we go, we set up a spot where she can, you know, do her thing. So uh, when we get a little bit more, uh, in a permanent place. I'm definitely looking forward to making her a place that she could just go wild. And I can't you wait just to bought a it place up. out in the Hamptons. Mm -hmm. So you like are now like a Hamptonian. Yes, I'm a neighbor. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's an invasion. We are coming out, okay? <laughs> well, you know, you've been warned. The suburbs ain't safe. Uh-uh, exactly. <laughs> Ring the alarm. <laughs> exactly. You got to have that space. So mm -hmm. this is a beautiful thing. You know, I spent the whole pandemic out there. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people don't realize that there has traditionally been a Black enclave there. Um, and there's obviously been a history of artists living there. So 
mm-hmm. you know, in some respects, we're just following yet another tradition. And mm-hmm. I like that kind of thing. I like following tradition in that sense of like, okay, there's others who have done this type of thing before. What will that add? What will I gain? What will I learn from that? How does it shift the work? How does it affect us? You know? Right. Well, at least it gives us fresher air to breathe, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. just take advantage of the that geographical location, which is great. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping to go surfing with you at some point, but I'm just worried I might not be able to keep up with you. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, no, you will. You will. You will. You might not be able to keep up with me cycling, though. On my road bike. <laughs> right, right. And now I'm doing 100 miles a week. So Seriously? averaging about, yeah, no, for real. It changed my body. I don't mean, I don't want to stand up, but it's like, look at how <laughs> now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, you know, that's one thing I actually forgot to say when I was visiting you in the studio is that you said you've reached a certain level of maturity. But the funny thing is you appeared much younger when you started to make this work. You know, yeah, the energy the and, and on my shoulders. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. No, because you're much lighter. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like, you know, like a, I don't know, like born again Christian, everybody go read Eckhart Tolle, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you'll be saved. You know, that's not an appropriate thing to do. But for me, it really worked because I really understood what he was saying and how to confront those negative thoughts when they come into your head in order to be able to push them to the side. Because for me, the creativity comes from a place of what, I think you know, like the Buddhists talk about no thought, where it's just like, uh, you know, it's like open. And to do that work, you have to come from a place of no thought. People would ask me like, is there an algorithm? And I'm like, ew, that's like so gross. I don't want an algorithm. Like, are you right. kidding me? Like, right. this has to be spontaneous. This has yeah. to be in the Let's moment. Let's go for a polyrhythm. Forget the algorithm. Let's go for the polyrhythm. Yeah. And th- and what you just mentioned before, like about your daughter, that little three-letted word, like joy. Joy. Oh, just like, huh? She's like, I just want to do this right now. And then she's yeah. done. And I'm like, you did it all. It all happened right there. I just watched it all go down in five to 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you know? Mm-hmm. Freedom. And I think the joy is something that, you know, in the art world, it's been suppressed. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, everybody's like, when I was in the Whitney program, everybody's like, you know, just trying to use words that are not in a dictionary. And, you know, like, I'm so smart and I'm an intellectual. And then you would see their work and it was ugly and it had no soul, no heart, no nothing, you know. And it was like, mm-hmm. oh, that's great. I'm glad that I read that handout, you know, from, I don't know, Walter <laughs> Benjamin or whomever, you know, <laughs> to begin to understand this. But <laughs> this is like, this is not touching me. And the important thing is to have the work touch you, like your piece, uh, what is it, uh, with the piano, Blossom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. touches you. You yeah. see that and you're like, oh man, the piano, strange fruit. The tree can relate it to the Buddha, can relate it to freaking hangings down south and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, and it's it's just like it's the full like package, you know? It's a whole and I'm making a circle because that's what it's mm-hmm. what it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I have a question for you. Um, and you can choose to answer it or we can move on to something else. But I was just sort of wondering how do you feel about what's your thoughts about representation. So much of your work before was a certain type of representation. There are representational elements now in your work, but they're very different. The effect of tone is very different. And at a time when, you know, back when you were making the earlier work, there weren't that many images of us in institutions. Right. And the mass produced images of us were usually negative. And there's still a lot of that today, but there are a lot of counter um, active um, images of us now, way more than there's ever been in the past. Right. So I'm sort of thinking about how are you feeling about representation? Just your thoughts on it. Um, and I say, I mean, I think I paved the way for a lot of people too. <laughs> in oh, order yeah. to do that. Um, I mean, it's interesting because after I had my epiphany or my enlightenment, I felt it wasn't so much about me personally 
and that it was more about like if you look at the soul culture work they're portraits but they're made up of lots of other people so all these other people kind of create the whole for this person that it's supposed to be a portrait of so i mean i don't know i mean i feel like you know i did my job <laughs> in terms of that and mm -hmm. it's time mm -hmm. for me to you know move on to other things i mean where i make a correlation with your work is you know with cosmetology and you know the cosmos and creating this world that we create for ourselves mm -hmm. and that's kind of like where i'm at right now especially with soul culture or even some of the portraits that i did during the pandemic and whatnot you know, I want to create my own little heaven sanctuary um, where people play by my rules mm -hmm. in my world. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I am right now. You know, in the past, I mean, my strategy was very much, I would take that art historic, like you could literally go through the art history book and just do all that revisionist work. Yeah, right, and, right. And, you know, and I always say, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to do, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I feel, I'm past that now. Mm -hmm. I'm past that. I want mm -hmm. my own, my own thing. I want to be in a place where I'm comfortable, where I feel full. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh. I'm going to pop back in for a minute. We've got a couple of questions in the chat and then I have a few also, but I really, I like this format because it is like watching two longtime creative colleagues catch up, you know, and, um, and so it's really revealing and kind of generous of you both to let us in on this conversation. And I know also that you both lived kind of around the world and uh, Sanford, you've lived in, I believe, Germany and in Japan. And Renee, you've lived in France and Italy. And, um, and it's a very strange time, obviously, to be back here living in the US. The first question from an anonymous attendee relates to this. Uh, here she says, you two have the most beautiful souls. And I wanna thank you so much for your work. But what is the opinion, your opinion, on the upcoming election? And have you done or are you thinking of doing any works representing the election? You, you want this one first? Stafford. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't particularly have any work that I think will come out of this election. But I say that because I think I've done work that dealt with this election the entirety of my career. So, um, and it's actually something I want to point out with uh, how you know, lucky we all are to be able to see so many years, decades of Renee's work. It's because part of understanding art and an artist is to see the work over time. It's not just one or two images. It's really that person's journey visually, artistically, creatively, that I think gives us the bigger picture. Um, so when it comes to my response or my feelings toward the election, I feel like, you know, same shit, different day. So, <laughs> exactly. Um, with that being said, everyone should go out and vote. I am not cynical and don't think that we can't effectuate some change. But you know, um, I don't. I would probably personally not be responding directly to that. I think about, about the larger si si system, um, and I consider the election just a symptom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, the way that I addressed it was with the signing, you know, the rewriting mm -hmm. of the constitution. And that for me at the time, I mean, it was sort of a stretch because that meant coming out of what I was currently doing, which was soul culture, dealing with fractals and sacred geometry and the spirituality of things. But in that moment when he got elected, I was like, oh crap, you know, I've got to do something. I, I kind of have to return to my roots mm -hmm. and do something that would try to, you know, um, balance this horror show that's happening right now with him. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, yeah. moving forward, I mean, 
I mean, I can't think of something that I would necessarily do around it, you know, per se, you know. I mean, it's just like annoying things like this weekend in the Hamptons, there was like five miles of like Trump supporters. It was unbelievable what flags and Trump signs and just honking their horn all going down 27. And that was quite appalling. And, and <laughs> some of them have their license plates obscured with tape, which ah, is- I did not see that. Yeah, uh, no, there, were, they, there were photographs of license plates that they put tape over. And wow. I don't know how that can happen in this day and age, how you can do a parade that extends all the way to Montauk with yeah. that license plates. Um, That's funny. <laughs> Um, you know, actually, I have a little more to say about that, though. Um, the show that is opening uh, at, at Bosky Gallery um, is called Soft Truths. And um, though I wouldn't say that it has necessarily, it's not directly related to the election, but it is directly related to history, government, democracy, and so on. Um, another reason why I've been using the marble so much, because marble has always been used as a propagandist tool uh, a lot mm -hmm. of times for what many in Western culture consider to be the bastion of Western achievement would have been, which would have been, you know, Roman, Greco-Roman culture. Um, you know, of course, not looking at Egypt and all the other offshoots thereof, but you know, Soft Truth talks about that. But once again, that's more about systems than the specificity of this election. Right. We have a question from Roa for Renee. What was the book and who was the author of the book that helped you on your journey? I think that was Eckhart. Totally. Yeah, it was Eckhart Tolle, and he's got numerous books from The Power of Now, The New Earth, but the one that really got me was Dealing with the, was it, uh, dealing with the Liberated Life, at, no, uh, Living the Liberated Life and Dealing with the Pain Body. That's one. And point. I would suggest to anybody get them as audio books because you need to reprogram <laughs> your mind. <laughs> Because just reading it's not enough. I mean, when I started with it, I used to just keep like my headphones in my ear. And even if I was consciously listening to it, fine. But just a constant reminder because society is always drawing you back in, into the poison, you know, like, like Netflix, which I like, but it's like so hard for me to watch stuff on there. Everything's violent and it's undermining other human beings and torturing them and you know, the only things I can watch there are like home improvement shows or extraordinary homes and stuff like that, you know, because it's toxic. Yeah. So we have a, a question from Johnny. Uh, so how does one position themselves to have their work shown in these spaces of which you speak? Practical steps, not philosophical direction, directing. <laughs> also, where do you stand in the desire to be validated by institutions? <laughs> um, on a practical level, um, I would say be realistic to what you want to achieve. Um, there's more than one art world. You know, we're operating in a very specific art world. Um, New York City, uh, international, gal you know, consumer gallery, high-end gallery, you know, uh, industry. But there's several other art worlds to be part of. So be realistic. Where do you really want to be? Um, and then do what everyone does in every other field. Start to meet the people. Put yourself out there. Network. Go to the exhibitions. Meet the artists. Meet the curators. <clears throat> Find out what ideas are really happening and where you fit in, if you fit in. Um, but I think it should be realistic because there's all kinds of measures of, su of success. So rather than look at mine or Renee's, it's probably important to make your own in that process. And um, what was the last part? Validation, institutional validation? Yeah, institutional validation. Mm -hmm. I will say personally for me, it was and has been important to have work in museums. Um, and that's always been a strategic thing because for the most part, in terms of part of this art world that we're talking about and the world of culture, museums end up being the repository for those objects and ideas. And I'm not saying that, once again, that's not the only place where that can happen. But in the past, that's where it's been. And that's where, when I was coming up as an early artist, it was important for me to have work go there. Before I was even interested in being in collective homes, I was interested in being in the institutions so that you can go through 
the African section of an encyclopedic museum, and if they have a contemporary section, key work of mine, you start make the, making the connection between what you saw over there and what you saw in the contemporary domain. Um, because there's a conceptual dialogue that I was interested in. And so part of the backdrop, the canvas, the, uh, the context for me was, you know, museums. So, um, yeah, no, that's my brief answer to that. Um, I would echo the same thing. Yeah, I would say pick your grad school wisely. <laughs> You know, so you start making your connections, you know, right from the beginning, so to speak. And uh, that's if you want to go to grad school. I think, you know, some true. people, you know, true. We haven't even talked about it. We haven't even got to that, Renee. I know. What's up? <laughs> I know. Um, you Maybe. know, because it was like when I was coming up back in the day, I mean, being a fashion photographer certainly wasn't enough to make the transition. I mean, it was imposed on me. It, you know, I was told, like, if you didn't get an MFA, we're not even looking at you. Yes. So, and that didn't even count for much. The only thing that really counted was, I'd say, the Whitney Independent Study Program, which was like the clearinghouse. And you were there with my friend who was your friend, Michael Richards. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Well, for me, I got the MFA because, um, you know, as a young black man making installation work and sculptures mm -hmm. and sound and video, stuff that wasn't painting and easily uh, sellable. I was like, I need a plan B. So I need this degree so that I can teach. Exactly. Um, I was 27 or 28 when I went to grad school. So it was not after undergrad. I went out and lived around the world for some time before I did all that. <clears throat> but it was a means to an end. And it wasn't to get with the gallery specifically because that wasn't necessarily the route at that point that has become the route but it wasn't even that when renee and i were doing all that stuff right no for sure i mean and back then it was like yeah get your masters and then maybe you can go off and be an adjunct which was like whoa what kind of crap is that <laughs> you know and not get paid you know <laughs> like three thousand dollars that's like i remember in the beginning somebody said oh well, it's three thousand dollars i said oh three thousand a week right they're like, no, 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 that's the semester. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, anonymous question. Given that the personal is political, do you think that work that doesn't overtly deal with the, a political perspective, such as pure abstraction, is relevant today? And thank you both for continuing to put your amazing work out into the world. Renee? <laughs> Wait, this is about you. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I keep directing it over to you. I'm okay. like, no, it's not Sanford. It's not about Renee Cox. I'm just the, you know, conduit here. So. Um, I think all work has a political read to it, whether it is intentional or not. I think, you know, just as I say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Politics could also be in the eye of the viewer. It depends what you bring to it. I think the alchemy of visual art is the artist as an author puts something out in the world, but the way it is perceived and um, ingested by another person is totally based on their subjective experiences through life, their exposure to certain things, their visual literacy, cultural literacy, political, historical, blah, 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 literacy. Um, so, you know, I think as artists, we make something, we put it out there, but we know that we're not completing the equation. We're only doing what we can do from our vantage point. Um, right. So that being said, I think all artwork is relevant all the time. In fact, I would hate to live in a world that only had one type of art. I want there to be abject, abstract, representational, figurative. I want to see it all. The more, right. the better. No, exactly. It's just expression. So the more people that can express themselves, the better off we are. I have a question from Charlene Stevens. The Chimera series resonates with me and my experience as the only black woman in my art history department. I specialize in Western antiquities. It was considered the standard. I only had African art available as an elective. How do you see the state of art history departments today and what advice do you have for black art history students? Um, well, Charlene, I remember having lunch with you in Amsterdam once and talking about some of these issues. And um, I know what you speak because uh, I remember you were in the program in the Netherlands at the time. Um, 
I think that's part of what we're doing. I think part of what we're trying to do is reinterpret these can canonical works of art and, and genres and periods that we all, any art student has to know. I, I won't say we have to know, but we are forced to learn because it has been the uh, basically the dominant narrative so far in any art historical um, program. Okay. That being said, you know, there are some places that don't even have the African art elective. So on some levels that was lucky, but that is still under representation. And there shouldn't just be the African art, there should be um, art from India, from pre-Columbian societies, from Asia, blah, 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 everywhere. Because every culture has a canonical body of work. They all have to, it doesn't matter when it happened, it's all canonical because that was the culture. And I think that kind of expansive view of art is very important. And where we find, I mean, now's a good time to start demanding that kind of um, educational representation because that is a language if we are trying to redefine and evolve as a culture if necessary. So professionals like Renee and myself and yourself and all the curators out there, the other artists, everybody coming down, down, down the way has to demand this stuff. And where it's not already given to you, you can go out and find it because all the stuff is out there in the world. Exactly. I would say so, that, sorry, not the great, ahead, but just to add that, I mean, it's their responsibility those people studying art history now to bring our art or histories to the forefront. Mm -hmm. That's for me, that's their job at this point in time. You know, yes, you might be inundated with all this European, Caucasian, blah, 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 but you've got to start doing your research and bring forth the things that we've done and get mm -hmm. rid of these uh, skewed uh, viewpoints. Like, you know, like speaking of like the Almac or something like that, and they're going to go, Oh no, like they're not African. It's like, I'm looking at the statues and I'm like, clearly they are African. <laughs> like, how mm -hmm. did they get here? You know, mm -hmm. don't feed me this thing that they're, you know, Indians that I don't know, they had whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like lip injections. Came over on the Bering Strait. Uh, exactly. This is coming from West Africa. Like, no, because that's the other mm -hmm. thing. I mean, it's like, there's this other history of like, we were just all slaves. No, we weren't all slaves. Obviously we've been traveling around the freaking world forever. You know, Christopher Columbus and those people were primitive. They thought the world was flat. He was trying to find the East Indies and he ended up in the West Indies. You know, I mean, it's like, really guys? Come on, go to Fiji. These people, they have froze and whatnot. They're dark. How did they get there? You know, nobody was bringing over slave ships to Fiji as far as I know. So it's like, no, we've been, we're, we, we're the first people, right? So, I mean, you know, I can't help it if some white people went north and they lost the pigmentation in their skin, their hair, their eyes and everything else. And then somehow have these delusions of grandeur. <laughs> because before that, I mean, it was, people of color, you know, from Egypt and Mesopotamia to like, you know, South America, the Olmec, the Aztec, these are people of color, come on. Now, you know? yeah, another reason I started that Chimera series is going through the canonical works and mashing them up, remixing them, um, fleshing out the story, um, not giving you an answer, not saying it's just this one way, but right. this is another way. This is another, mm -hmm. another story to be told and to, be interpreted. I agree. And that's what the art history students now, that's what their thesis should be based on. Mm -hmm. Stuff along those lines. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, about four or five more questions and I'm going to try to merge some of them in the interest of time. But this is from an anonymous attendee. Who are emerging artists that spark your interests and inspire you? Um. I mean, there's a lot. I'm trying to think, you know, you know how this goes. You think about <laughs> artists a whole bunch of times, and then when you ask the question, none of the names are going to pop up in your head. Right. Um, do you have anyone that you can say right now, Renee, while I try to trigger my synapses to get the right person, the right few people out? I mean, I would go like, you know, somebody like, you know, my fellow Jamaican, maybe Ebony Patterson comes to right. mind. I love it. I love yeah. It. Um, <laughs> Derek Fougeron. I was about to see, Derek was someone I was about to say. Yeah. Cullen Washington was another person I was going to say. Who? Um, Cullen Washington. Okay, yeah. I don't know if you met him yet, but I'll share some of his work with you. He's doing some really interesting stuff right now. Okay. Um, uh, 
Allison Janae Hamilton. That's another artist where I think is yeah, really good stuff. Uh, there's a former student of mine in Poland. Oh my God. Okay. No, I got to find his name. Keep talking. I'm going to find his name for you. All right. Because I just um, drawn a blank. Yeah, I'm trying to think who else. I mean, like, it comes to mind, like, quickly. I mean, there's a, certainly a lot more of them than when I started out, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and thankfully. Thank you. Yeah. There's, you know, um, there's I, a lot more to see. Yeah. Know, this is a good moment to, um, you know, to see art, I believe. I mean, pandemic, <laughs> right. excluding the pandemic aspects of it in terms of, uh, what's available creatively right now and visibly, there is so much. So I'm going to merge two questions while you're looking, Sanford. So this uh -huh. is from Julie Walker and from Corinne Ernie, who is at the Parish Art Museum. Yes. Um, so Julie is asking about how you're dealing with the loss of mega art shows. Right now, you'd be gearing up for Bi Miami Basel. Everything's been canceled and moved online. Um, how is that shift? affecting you. And then Corinne uh, asked about this shift of galleries to the East End in the Hamptons. Um, mm. And how is, is that a positive change? Is it making more people aware that there's a vibrant artist community out here? How do you feel about um, that reorganizing of the art world during the pandemic? Well, in terms of uh, the, you know, seeing exhibitions, um, unfortunately, I have not been able to see many as of yet, but I plan to start going as I'm, you know, well, we'll see what happens in the next few weeks. You know, there's so much happening worldwide right now that it's hard to uh, prioritize that right now, I hate to say. But the idea that you can go into a museum or a gallery and see a show unfettered by multitudes of people being there is exciting. I think it gives a moment for art to really take, um, art versus the cult of personality to take you know, precedence again. So I think that's great. Um, as far as the mega shows like the fairs and so on, you know, I'm, I don't miss that. So um, I'm more of an exhibition person than I am a fair person. So um, that's not, not a visual loss for me. Plus you can see things online to the degree you can so that when those people's work come in, you know, three dimensions near you, you, you can go see it. So you can pick and choose. Yeah. Um, and what was, there was another part. What? Yeah, maybe since, since you're newish to the oh, Hamptons, yes, yes. you have your family in, you know, Sag Harbor, your, your mother-in-law, but um, there has been this huge shift of, of mega galleries as um, the question posed to the Hamptons. And what is that? How does that affect you, Renee? You've been here a long time. Well, so far it hasn't affected me at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, for those mega galleries, you know, they're probably smart to go where the money is, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, 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 think I mean, so. why not? Yeah, yeah, I have to see how it pans out, but I think it could be, it's really interesting because um, I'm always, I mean, and Renee will tell you this, I'm a studio rat. I'm in my studio all the time. I don't go to nearly enough social events in the art world. I'm always saying, God, I wish I could be there. And I'm like, wait, I could be there, but you know what? I'd rather just work and I just work. Right. Um, and moving out there, I thought that was gonna be the case and it will be to a degree, but there's also this added um, uh, trend of the galleries moving out there. So in some respects, some of that social aspect of the art world is out there and it's in a much more, in a much smaller degree and probably easier to find and connect with the people so that you can have a more meaningful experience once that happens. So I do look forward to that. Yeah, no, likewise, that'll be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, I, I saw you giving a tour of the show at LA MOCA, Stanford. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were talking about Al Loving, his work. Mm -hmm. He's someone that is in the Guildhall collection and who was a member of the East End community. So there's a lot of artistic stories to unearth here, of, you know, writers, performers, visual artists. Sure. And the, you know, because of your family in, in Sag Harbor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, there's some, um, I look forward to that too, being able to take a little time and find out more about who was there. Cause I'm sure there were people there that I don't even know. And that's yeah. not just in the Hamptons, that's all out East. Um, right. right. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
particularly the area where I was living in Sag Harbor over in, uh, in Nineveh for a while, a lot of the black community there, they are all, um, they all treasure the artists, those African American artists that have been out there for years. And they are the ones with those books and the catalogs and the stories and, you know, the cocktail party memories and so on. So I'm getting a lot of that kind of history too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have two questions left and they're, they're kind of nice, easy ones. Uh, what, this is from Ada Rivero. What music or albums have each of you been enjoying recently? And thank you for doing this today. We didn't even talk about moon medicine. No, we did not talk about moon medicine. No, we I didn't. know, like how did we not talk about moon medicine? That's um, Sanford's amazing bands. Yeah, yeah moon, moon Medicine, you know, there'll be something to talk about soon. Yeah, we're getting ready to uh, release a lot of things because the digital format is something that actually can work for our format in a way that um, it may not work for other performers. So we're exploring all kinds of things and I'm sure we'll be releasing stuff within the next few weeks, to be honest. Um, but with that in mind, some of our collaborators are people who I've been listening to. So I've been listening, you know, I'm always listening to Michelle and Debbie Ocello, who uh, also has worked with us before and we're getting prepared to do something together quite soon. Um, Andre Simone is a member of Moon Medicine, but an artist of his own right. He was also probably best known originally as Prince's original bassist. And he is the co-creator co of the Minneapolis sound that Prince became very popular for, obviously. Right. Um, um, also working on something with one of my favorite MCs, um, Pharaoh Monch, um, formerly of Organized Confusion and also solo artist for many years. And one of my favorite lyricists, period. He's incredible. And a very wide um, aesthetic sense, sonic and musical aesthetic sense. So looking forward to working with him. Um, and listening to, to more of his music. He has some new releases coming out with his new band called 13. Um, let's see, who else? Oh, Robert Glasper. I've been listening to a lot of Robert Glasper lately. Always listening to Herbie Hancock. Um, Moses, Moses, um, Moses Sumney. Been listening to him lately. Saul Williams. Uh, who else? Uh, Anderson Pack. I love Anderson Pack. Mm. And the Free Nationals. Wow, this is a good answer. Right. Can you send me that list? <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and Moon Medicine has played all over the, the country, right? Wait, did you yeah. play the Kennedy Center? Did I read that you played the Kennedy Center? We played Lincoln Center. We played Kennedy Center. Um, we played the Apollo. We played the Red Rooster. played Hammer Museum. played Art Basel. Um, and we were supposed to be playing Rockefeller Center this September, but that will be postponed till next year. Mm. Um, doing a live performance uh, right there in the, in the middle of the plaza. So we have big projects, uh, you know, lined up when the world gets back to normal. But in the interim, the good thing about the way our project works is very much a conceptual art piece as well. So the piece that we last did at the Kennedy Center was called Untelevised Revolutions. And the setup was basically a party that was happening in the Kennedy Center and all of the audience was there standing up, dancing, drinking, listening to a DJ. And that party got invaded by some renegade runaway um, musicians, which was of course the band in full costume and the lights get shut down. And then we get up on an elevated stage and do this, you know, hard performance for around a good hour or so with video and lights and all kinds of subversive political messages and sound bites thrown in. And then at the end, of course, we all have to run away because um, somebody's found our feed and the cops are coming. So we have to break out. Um, so we're able to find a way to recreate that digitally. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with people in the next few months. That sounds phenomenal. Renee, mm -hmm. do you want to add your soundtrack? My song's wrong. Hmm. It's a car tolling. <laughs> Just a constant reminder, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, lately I've been revisiting Jean-Michel Jean for oh, some yeah. reason. Yeah. yeah, Equinox and whatnot. Oxygen. Mm -hmm. so it's the oh. biggest concert ever. Huh? He did the biggest concert ever in uh, the history of humanity in Houston, Texas, where uh, oh. 
there was like one of the musicians was supposed to be on the space shuttle. It was this thing, yeah. Uh, Michel Jar. Uh, okay, so I think it's six fifteen. I just want to tell you a couple of thanks from people and give you one last question to take us out. Uh, so her, her uh, Helene Soller says, "You look." You took us on a wonderful journey through work and personal quests. Thank you. Uh, Carol Pelligan says, thank you for the great session. And then the last question comes from present tense, Black Lives Matter. What people in history inspire your ideas and work? Oh, uh, I know. Marcus Garvey. A word. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> Grandma Moses. Grandma yeah. Moses, me, Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that film they did did not do her any justice. <laughs> I mean, how are you going to do Harriet Tubman? I mean, how are you, uh -huh. you going to do Tubman? You know? I don't know, but not like that. <laughs> 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 I was like, poor Harriet had to be rolling over in her grave. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I like to consider Harriet Tubman an astronaut because, uh, you know, navigating the stars, leading people to freedom. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, I love her, but does she need the remake on that film? <laughs> <laughs> when are they going to do the Garvey film and the Black Star Line? When's that going to happen? I don't know. Somebody should. I don't know. Well, it's out there in the ether now. If it's out there in the ether. <laughs> exactly. It's in the universe. Mm -hmm. It shall manifest itself. Mm -hmm. Now, that story needs to be told. Yeah. Because I go like, you know, we've got to take uh, authority for our own trajectory. Mm -hmm. So, and um, he was really about that before, mm -hmm. you know, the FBI destroyed him and all those other entities. So his message, I think, would be quite pertinent right about now. Mm -hmm. Because I've been saying during the pandemic, we need to have like our own black political party. You know, even though I know we're not all on the same page, we're not this monolithic thing, but I say just as is, as a group, if we could just come together under this umbrella and do what the other people do in terms of lobbying politicians, in terms of getting things done and saying, hey, I'll give you 30 million votes, but this is what I need you people to do. All and day. One thing, stop killing our goddamn youth every week because this is, it's, it's ridiculous, it's sickening. You know, Normalized. it's going on for 400 years, so it's time for it to be over. Yeah, so I think that's for me the only way things may change peacefully, you know, and I would trust that that could happen. But have you uh, checked out Ice Cube lately? You know, he's been talking about a lot of this publicly lately. Yeah, you should what, check him out. Of just maximizing the block, yeah, the voting block. Yeah, absolutely. Right. No, this is the only way because I mean the Democrats have just taken us for granted, you know, <laughs> that we're all going to vote Democratic, yeah. Yeah. Which Seriously. we will, but I'm <laughs> saying it's like, if we had well, our own party, then we can begin to negotiate. And then when they start killing, you know, our kids, there's repercussions. They don't go into other communities and kill their children every week. Man. Why? Because there's repercussions from that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, marching is really great, but we've been marching since 1963, you know, and singing, we shall overcome. It's not doing the trick, you know, at all. So that's just my point of view on things. Yeah. You know, I'm too old to be out there in the front lines, but <laughs> I say to the youth, come on, you know, <laughs> like, let's organize, you know what I'm saying? And I worry about Black Lives Matter because I see some... It gets co-opted, you know. This one's life matter, that one's life matter. And I'm like, no, nobody likes matter. I'm very sorry to tell you until black lives matter. That's what we're working on and that's it, you know. And for me, if you're black, I don't care what you are, what you do, you're included in the party. You can be trans, you can be a hunchback, you could be a midget, whatever, you know. <laughs> If you're black and you have melanin, you're in. That's it. Well, so we I, don't have to have any arguments about, you know, all the little, you know, subgroups and everything else because that's all part of that whole divide and conquer thing. Mm -hmm. so, so from your mouth to God's ears, they're <laughs> saying, "Yay, black 
political party, yes. Yeah. Um, Black independent party, why not? Any, and if uh, there's anyone in film production who wants to make the Marcus Garvey film. Call and, me, call me. Because you were on mm -hmm. Antebellum. Yes. yes. Did, did you were consulted on Antebellum. Yes. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All With right. Janae and Gerald and Chris and the, you know, the whole team. Yeah, that was a great experience. So it's uh, 20. All right. So we're gonna no, that's very fierce. Monique Meloche uh, from Chicago says she loves you both and thank you. And um, I just want to thank you guys so much. Once again, this is a series of conversations spearheaded by Renee Cox, who's organizing an exhibition of Black artists at Guildhall for 2023. So these series will be ongoing <laughs> and, uh, and also Sanford has a show coming up at Marion Boski Gallery in February. No, Boski opens October 30th. October 30th, okay. And Code Switch at the Bronx Museum is up now and will close in January, February, 2021. Okay, excellent. That's terrific. So everybody thank you so much for joining us we had a great conversation here lots of love for you guys coming through right now on the farewells um so we will be in touch for the next panel discussion and you'll find a recording of this one on the guilt hall youtube channel so thanks everybody thank you guys for opening up and letting us know you know how your inner workings go and uh and for all the amazing suggestions for music and readings and movies and art. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Peace and love. Peace and love. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> <laughs>